Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 28th, 2022 Planning Board meeting. If we could please first stand for the pledge. Pledge of allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we got some correspondence. Anybody need to review anything there? Nothing here. So that is about the Yorktown Energy Storage again. Yep. The batteries that they came back to get approved, they can't buy. They're not available. So they go back so, to the original approval? No, they're proposing two different kind of Tesla batteries that they can fit on the area they just got amended. <clears throat> There's some minor variations, right? I think. Very strange. To the footprints and things like that. Yeah. Is this through the supply chain? Yeah. Mm. Yep. The fenced in area is the same. The pad is a little small. But so we we put it corresponding to the team as well as also rising to the amendments, formal amendments that they'll present. Well, I looked at the material they submitted. I don't see any reason why we can't just Memo. Accommodate their situation. <clears throat> it doesn't change any substantive part of this plan. Right, I agree. Yeah. Uh, there's no. In fact, the bed is going to be smaller from what I can see. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Any issues? No issues here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll get a memo. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, we didn't sign their plan yet. So oh, we didn't. They're All just right. going to put these on it. Okay. Okay. All right, and we have next the draft minutes from the March 14th meeting. Any amendments, comments, concerns? No comments. Nothing? I wasn't there. Oh, that's right. <laughs> they have yours here. We have to change that. Then. That's not true. All right, do I have a motion then to approve the March 14th, 2022 meeting minutes? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. See, last time they had it worked out who was in the first and second every time. So I, <laughs> just go, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go into the regular portion of the meeting. We have first on the agenda the Kitchewan Solar. This is a decision statement, site plan, and special permit. Location 716 Kitchewan Road. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Very well, thank you. Crazy weather aside, yes. everything's fine. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to make a couple of notes um, before we look at the resolution or address any questions that the board has outstanding. Um, I did want to just note about the stormwater management plan. I know that it had been listed as an item that we were still working on the last time we were here. Um, we have submitted those updated plans uh, to the engineering department. Uh, and we'll be finalizing those uh, with Dan Ciarcia. Um Those are still showing uh, an improvement in peak flow rates. Um, and we have incorporated a uh, catch basin and level spreaders under the array. Uh, so I did just want to make a note of the updated layout that we have, which is maybe a little bit different than what you've seen. In the northwest corner, there is now a catch basin instead of what used to be two rows of modules. So I did just want to note that looks a little bit different than what we had seen. The uh, extent of the perimeter fencing and everything else has not changed. We've simply removed some modules to make room for that catch basin. Uh, I believe that is all. I was able to read through the resolution. Um, no issues there, aside from a minor typo, which I'll correct with Robin. Uh, and I believe those are all of my points for this evening. As always, thank you for your attention to this project. I know we've been working on this together for a long time, and I always appreciate the board's thoroughness. So thank you. Of course. I know Aaron had some questions. Well, I just, I know that a, the Tree Commission issued a memo on Friday. Have, have you seen that? I have, yes. And I know at the last meeting, in, at the end of February, I believe it was, we addressed the fact that the Tree Commission had some comments and you were going to further address those. Could you just tell us how you want to respond to their March 25th memo and how you address those concerns? Because I know it's in our proposed resolutions that should we adopt that tonight, we will be accepting 
your proposal, so. Sure, yes, absolutely. Uh, so the remaining comments that we saw um, from the Tree Commission last week, um, one was about the difference between a mitigation plan and a screening plan. So they've stated that our plan, uh, our landscaping plan as submitted is primarily screening. Um, although some of the trees are planted within the property for not screening purposes, we simply have not separated the two things. So there's trees that are for screening purposes primarily, trees that are being planted for mitigation purposes primarily. Um, we've done that in conjunction with the property owner for what they've asked for on their own property. Um, but to us, that really seems uh, somewhat irrelevant to the calculation of the mitigation ratio and the, ad you know, the adequate uh, mitigation measures that we're undertaking. The reason I say that's a bit irrelevant is because there's simply not enough area on the property to do the mitigation with solely planting trees, which is why we've offered payment into the tree bank fund as if there were no mitigation with planting trees. So we've uh, offered payment into the tree bank fund for all of the trees being removed and the entirety of the disturbed woodland area, mm. ignoring the mitigation that is happening with the landscaping plan, um, simply because with such a high mitigation ratio, we can't fit that number of trees required on the property physically. Um, so we've gone down this path instead. Uh, so we've not provided a separate mitigation plan because it would not be adequate even if we did provide it. Um, the second comment was uh, regarding the uh, tree work plan that we submitted and the exact uh, tree locations for the removal. Um, so as I've mentioned before, all of the trees are inventoried and tagged on site. So if someone were to physically walk the site, you would be able to identify every tree from our inventory. The reason they're not exactly located is because of how dense the wooded area is on the southern end of the property. With it having been a nursery that has sort of gotten overgrown, it's very difficult to geolocate exact tree locations. If we were to do that, it would just be a bunch of dots. It, it wouldn't really tell you any additional information. So what we've done is we've marked the plan with the range of trees. So it says, you know, trees one to 10 are approximately in this area, 10 to 40 are approximately in this area. That's at this point really the best we can do. Um, but obviously if you were to walk the site, you'd be able to check every single tree on the inventory with what's tagged on site. And that's what we will be doing when we remove the trees, we'll only remove the ones that have been tagged per that inventory. Uh, and the last comment was regarding the uh, plantings on the Western side of the property. So coming up along the access road um, those were primarily put in for screening purposes, which is why so many green giant arborvitae were selected along that area. We have worked with our landscape architect to increase the diversity a bit, but she's advised that if we increase the diversity any more, we're risking the screening purposes and we're risking having to come back in two years and replace those trees with green giant arborvitae anyway, because they won't survive, they won't thrive, you won't achieve the screening that we're trying to achieve along that western edge. Um, so that really was on advice of our landscape architect that we're not increasing the diversity any more than what we already have. So could you just summarize real quick, how many trees are you taking out? Sure. So uh, removal is 168 trees. And how many are coming in one way or the other? 198 trees and 328 shrubs for primarily beautification and screening, but plus, 198 trees plus payment into the tree bank fund. Okay. Uh, and that payment is $21,300. Thank you. So uh, what do you make of the Tree Commission's comments at this point? Is that something that we feel is satisfied by this presentation? I, I got to think so. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think it's satisfying. I, I mean, I, I do too. I'm just raising the issue to yep. make sure um, that we, we cover this. I mean, to get a thorough coverage there, which... And I know. think we, we talked about this uh, a bit last time about, uh, I know Sorry. Jim had some opinions about mitigation and the trees being planted for screening and the uh, kind yeah. of cross endorsement of that, so. Uh, you're speaking of Jim Glathar? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I spoke to him. He is going to revisit what he, uh, not revisit, but um, delve into what he had said that evening. I don't believe that he, um, said it in the way that has been presented after that. Uh, so I had a brief conversation with him. I, I don't think he sent anything officially or been here to give you any official uh, reading on what, what his, what his um, sense of that was. Uh, 
uh, my discussion with him was that, in my opinion, was that any tree that you plant on site or even off site under the tree code you can offer for mitigation. So I think all of the screening trees are available as part of the mitigation plan. That's my opinion. I believe Jim Glathor, but I will leave it to him. And I think that's his belief as well. Um, uh, and if there's any other question regarding any of the other things, but but, but I think that's the major one. So. Yeah, I can address it squarely. I did speak to Jim. You know, he's looked at the code. I've certainly looked at the code, uh, and his position is that screening trees can count towards mitigation, um, and I concur with that position. So if that's can the, can, can, can okay. absolutely. Can. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So there you go. We're all on the that takes care of that. We're all on the same page. Sure. Let's go. And for whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. uh, I, I did go back and look at the video from the, the January meeting, and I don't th I think his comments or I don't think he said that. <laughs> That's really what it comes down okay. to. So. Okay. All right. I don't think he said otherwise. Okay. okay. Thank you, Council. Sure. Anything else, John? No. That's it for now. Anything from the board? Nothing here. Dan, I see in the back there any issues? Or he was in the back. <laughs> I did see he, ra him. he ran out. <laughs> he ran out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So. Okay, and you've had a chance to review everything in the book? Yes. Okay, so first, do I have a motion to declare a lead agency? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Secondly, we have a neg deck in front of us. Do I have a motion? Motion. motion. Do I have a second? Aye. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Second. Aye. Okay. We're going to have to have a gong here. See? <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, we have a resolution approving a site plan, special use permit, stormwater permit, wetland permit, and tree removal permit for Kichwan Farm Solar Farm. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. <laughs> Here you go. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Why don't we just go left to right? There you go. Anyway, sure you know, uh, You're all set. All right. United we are. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck. Have a good night. Take care. All the best with the project. Okay, that is the end or the only, one and only uh, item in our regular session. We're going to move to the work session. I do see a lot of people here. I know we have some hot topics on the agenda tonight. I do want to mention that the work session is a discussion between the board and the applicant. So during the work session, there's no input from the public. We ask that you keep in touch. Uh, obviously, you can always reach out to the planning board, but during these meetings, it's just uh, basically a back and forth with the board and the, the applicant. That being said, first on the agenda is Underhill Farm. This is a discussion of the site plan, locations 370 Underhill Avenue. Robin, do I have to go back in again? I put that original, that last code that was in there. And then it, it changed? Yeah. Then you'll have to put this number in, I think. How do I put that back in? You'll just go in again from the beginning? You have the same, I guess you want this one. The FEIF, FEAF on this one. Mark Blanchard. How are you? Good, good. All right. <laughs> well, I can get started while we're um, loading up our, our uh, electronic presentation. You got get to use the mic. Use the mic. Yeah, You're gonna get in trouble in the back. <laughs> I'm told I'm really that. <laughs> oh, I don't want to see that. Okay, good evening. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you everyone hear me? Okay. All right. Um, I'm pleased to be here. My name is Mark Blanchard from the firm Blanchard and Wilson. Here on behalf of Underhill Soundview LLC, the owner of the property, owner of the project at 370 Underhill Avenue. Uh, I'm just going to give some very brief introductory remarks, summarize what we've, where we've been, and how we got back here. Um, as you know, we were an applicant. We brought a petition to the town board. Oops, I'm now straight from the microphone. We brought a t petition to the Town of Yorktown Town Board and are now in front of you, having been referred over to you, having met the criteria 
under Article 31, the new overlay uh, district legislation that was adopted recently. So here we are. We're very pleased to be back in front of you. Uh, just some of the um, talking points before we get started. Number one, what we're going to be showing you with this project is the site itself as it is today could use a little revitalization. I'm talking about the buildings, but also the natural space. So we're looking forward to showing you how we're going to re-energize and revitalize the entire campus, not just limited to building footprints, but the entire campus. We are also um, have always, from the first day, been engaged in the adaptive reuse, the voluntary adaptive reuse of the Captain Underhill historical structure. So that's going to be a part of our project. Uh, we're excited to share that with you. And we're the use of it itself will be a part of this discussion, but the building structure, the captain's main residence, will remain. Um, another exciting part of this project, you can see depicted there briefly, is the restoration of the existing ice pond. We're going to have offered to the public some passive recreation and active recreation features of our project. It's important to note that these features, though they will be accessible to the public, will remain privately maintained. Uh, by the applicant. So we're not increasing a burden on the town of Yorktown. To that end, with the installation of new infrastructure, we are engaged in a shared parking agreement and a shared parking requirement for the new senior center that's proposed at the Beaver Ridge residential complex that's adjacent to us. So with our project coming online, that senior center will also be allowed to come online. Um, and to that end, as it relates to infrastructure, We'll be adding uh, new, better and enhanced emergency first responder access through our parcel and in, up into the Beaver Ridge. So we feel it's another plus into the community. Um, we, other, uh, aside from the land use issues, we will be generating, we're projecting to generate at least $1 million annually in additional and new tax revenue into the town of Yorktown. And, and essentially... I would skip going through the eight criteria that the town found, but I would just reference generally that the town did pass a resolution showing that we did meet the eight criteria within Article 31. Like, for example, being in compliance with the town of Yorktown comprehensive plan and, and things of that nature. So not necessarily pl planning board uh, jurisdictional issues, but certainly for you know, the betterment of the town and those jurisdictional issues. So really, those are just my opening remarks. Um, we have the team of professionals here to go through a much more detailed presentation. Joe Reno from Site Design Consultants will uh, take the next step and start to go through the site plan. If you have any questions, please ask throughout the presentation so nothing gets lost until waiting until the end. Just ask us. We're here. We're happy to start this process and happy to answer any questions you have. Could we, not maybe for now, but next time, get a summary of those eight items and how they... Oh, absolutely. I'll email it uh, to John and Robert tomorrow. I, I submitted a letter. Uh, actually, it would be in my cover letter to this board. I just I just listed them, but I'll right. share the material to the town board. Just so we can make sure that the general public can everything. absolutely general public. All. Thank you. Hello, everybody. What's up, Joe? How are you? Okay, good. <clears throat> um, so uh, what what I've got up on the screen now is an aerial photo of the site. Um, the site is 13.8 acres. It's outlined <coughs> here in blue. Sorry. Fix the mic. Okay. Yep. Uh, so it's outlined here in blue. You can see Beaver Ridge to the to the uh, rear or to the north. Uh, Town Hall where we are now is uh, southeast here, and uh, Rochambeau is across the way. <coughs> so the site is at 13.8 acres. Uh, the main entry drive to the site um, is uh, at this location right here. Uh, it, it enters the site and splits the site. Uh, the pond is to the left. The Captain Underhill house is here to the right. Uh, the driveway circles uh, around the site. It uh, heads east in front of the Captain Underhill house. There's an existing parking lot here uh, adjacent to 118. Uh, it circles around the back here and loops back through to the main entrance. <coughs> um, there are um, existing structures to the rear of the site. Most, most of them are structurally unsound, and, and uh, all of them will be coming down as part of the development. Um, additionally, um, we will be making some improvements to Glenrock Street, which is to the west. Uh, it requires some drainage improvements. This area here is a wooded area. This is the wooded, most mostly wooded area of the site. 
Uh, this is where the uh, townhouse portion of the development is going to go, and there are some wetland areas on the site which Steve Marino will uh, give more detail on. Uh, there's an existing uh, fire road which accesses Beaver Ridge, and you could sort of make it out here. It goes in through, in through this uh, portion of the site. The wetland areas are to the left or west, and uh, um, the pond and developed portion of the site to the right of that, uh, that access road. So as um, Mark stated, we're in the uh, overlay district. Um, we believe the project is consistent with the intent of the overlay district. We have demonstrated consistency to the town board and uh, the project meets all the bulk standard re requirements for the, 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 the overlay zone. <coughs> um, we're not asking for any uh, special exceptions. Um, the proposal is for, let me just get to the site plan. Uh, the proposal is a, uh, uh, to construct a mixed-use development consisting of 148 dwelling units and approximately 11,000 square feet of retail space, which will be located under this portion of the proposed apartment uh, complex. Um, access to the project, we're going to maintain the existing main access, which would bring you into the center point of the project uh, to the right. Here will be the apartment complex development. To the left, you have, you'll have condos and townhouses up, uh, up on the uh, very west side of the property. Um, the project is adjacent to, to other multifamily developments. And what this figure is, is demonstrating or comparing is that um, our density is 10.7 units per acre. Beaver Ridge, which is to the north, is about 19.8 units per acre. And to the south, uh, the Rochambeau area is about 9.6 units per acre. Um, and there's about the capability or the potential for 20 plus unit per acre in, in the Heights area just adjacent to this. Uh, so we're right, you know, we're right in that range, and actually we're closer to the lower end of that lower end, lower end of that spectrum, uh, uh, with the 10.7. So the project is going to consist of uh, full renovation and restoration of the uh, Captain uh, Underhill House, which is located right here. Bring it in a little closer. Uh, that's located right here, so that's going to be uh, restored and, and uh, renovated, as I said. Um, there'll be uh, 52 townhouse units uh, uh, consisting of three and four bedrooms. Those will be here along the west side of the property, uh, two units right here, in addition to the uh, <coughs> other 50 units which are um, going to be accessed off a second, uh, or off a new access, which is opposite Rochambeau. <coughs> Uh, this building here will be 32 condominiums, one and two bedrooms, and there will be 64 apartments in the uh, apartment building structure. Uh, of all the dwelling units, 118 of them will be senior friendly, and more than half of, more than half, 60 or older, uh, will be accommodated. Uh, the FAR for the project is 0 .50, and it, it's less than the. Um, 0.55, which is the maximum allowed uh, in the overlay district. Some of the amenities that are uh, <coughs> part of the project is, of course, open space. There's going to be a lot of open space around the project, uh, uh, around the back of the units. As you make your way around, there's going to be a, a plenty of open space, but but mainly uh, mainly around the pond area. Um, other amenities that are going to be that are proposed are pool. There's going to be a pool here, which is going to uh, service the townhouses and the condominiums, and there'll be a clubhouse 
uh, within the uh, townhouse building itself, uh, just adjacent to the pool or direct access to the pool. The apartment complex will have its own pool area, which is right here. Uh, <coughs> infrastructure will include parking. We have uh, we we exceed the parking criteria for the project. Um, as you can see, there's some uh, parking here that's uh, for the Captain Underhill house. So you've got some parking adjacent to it in the front side and, and left side. Um, there's parking here along uh, Salmon River Road, which is consistent with what's there now. Our through access and our emergency access cut through uh, to Beaver Ridge will be right here. And this, this location here is where um, it's proposed to construct the senior center. Uh, it's, it's on the Beaver Ridge property, but we will be providing parking uh, on our, our site for that, uh, for the senior center. Um, the project's gonna be served by all major utilities, water, sewer, uh, gas and electric. The, uh, as I stated before, we're, we are planning to make some drainage improvements on, the, on Glen Rock Street, which has some issues right now. There's, there's really no control of the drainage uh, on that. Um, and we'll be providing on-site stormwater management. Uh, this project will require approval by uh, both the town and the DEP for a, from the stormwater management perspective. Um, Recognizing that this is the uh, gateway into the Heights, uh, Mr. Galero thinks it's really important to preserve uh, to the greatest extent possible the most visible part of the site along Underhill Avenue. So this is the existing main entrance here. Um, the, the pillars and gates and stone walls are all going to be preserved. And as you get down to the corner, at the corner, at the uh, northwest corner of uh, Underhill and 118, Sol uh, Soma River Road, um, this gate and pillar area is going to be maintained. There's a plaza area being proposed for this. Um, that's possibly subject to change depending on traffic improvements that may be required at that intersection. But as of now, the intent is to maintain this, create a little plaza, pedestrian plaza area here and if necessary, if this needs to be reconstructed, you know, because due to traffic improvements, that's, uh, that, that's what will be done. The front of the site is, the intent of the front of the site is to, to maintain as close to the character uh, as we can to what it is now, enhancing it. Um, the pond will be enhanced. Pathways with sitting areas will be proposed around the pond. Uh, a, uh, the pond will be enhanced with additional landscaping, trees, and plantings. Uh, what, what, what it's not represented on here, but you'll see on a later plan that uh, Steve Marino will present. Um, there's going to be a wetland area created at the head of the pond and uh, uh, a, a uh, stormwater channel which runs through the site will be realigned and enhanced uh, with, a, with a walking bridge uh, crossing over it here at this por portion of the uh, pathway. Uh, a uh, pocket, let me get, just get to that sheet, excuse me. It's a little more technical, but let me give you the idea. Okay, I guess we're gonna use this. And this is the plan that Steve's gonna be presenting to you, but uh, I'm not gonna get into his into his um, information. But in this area here, uh, we'll be creating a pocket wetland, which will be used for stormwater management. Um, and other areas of the site, is, it's not fully detailed yet, but there'll, 
green infrastructure will be used throughout the project uh, on the site development portion itself and, and partially on the buildings. Um, as Mark had stated, the area around the pond um, will be a destination open to the public uh, to, to use all year round for walking, relaxation, ice, ice skating, etc. That's it on my presentation. Uh, do you, who, who's going next? Steve, Steve I'll have you up. So okay. you go next. So. Okay. You, I'll, I'll zoom back in. You, need to. you want me to zoom? Or you can do? It? Well, I think I can. Okay. Just watch. I think it falls off the page. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Steve Marino, Tim Miller Associates. I'm speaking slowly so I get it right this time. <laughs> um, and there'll be no mention of Phragmites tonight. Even though <laughs> I know that's one of your favorite topics. But um, uh, here it's, I'm with Tim, Tim Miller Associates. We're representing the uh, applicant in environmental issues, and that would be wetlands, natural resources, um, some of the socioeconomic and demographic stuff that we'll be talking about as well. Um, but primarily I'm here to talk about the wetlands and, and trees on the property. Um, during our initial surveys of the property, we did locate, I have to switch my glasses if you don't mind. Okay. There were three separate wetland areas identified on the property. Um, there are these two smaller areas you see in orange there. Each one is under a 20th of an acre, the 2,000 square feet plus or minus each. Um, they are associated with what used to be an old farm road that moved through the property from approximately where our new entrance will be over to where the Beaver Ridge condos are. There is still an old road bed out there and what happened is there's compacted soils and, and stuff that was moved as the road was constructed. So there are two small pockets there that over the years have become uh, identifiable as wetlands under the town regulation. Army Corps of Engineers and the DEC mm -hmm. wouldn't regulate these but they are still regulated as, uh, under the town um, definition. Uh, and then the third part was this, was the water course that enters the site from Glen Rock, flows through the property from west to east, and enters the existing pond on the property. The total of that stream and pond corridor is a little under an acre uh, at this time. Uh, our proposal it's, <coughs> is to relocate that channel, the, the stream part of that channel. There's an existing culvert on the site right about here where the, uh, the, the water course goes underneath that existing driveway the, or the old, like I say, the old farm road, the old traveled way. Um, that culvert is uh, approximately in the area where we, we will be uh, relocating the water course. Um, that's an eroded ditch. It's a picking up primarily runoff from Glen Rock and Underhill Avenue and routing it through the site. There is some groundwater contribution from the hill um, further to the west, but you know, when, if you're out on the site, you'll see that there isn't any direct stream or corridor coming to that point under Glen Rock and onto the property. It's really a collection of some groundwater discharge and some stormwater runoff periodically. As you get down to the pond, then we have the pond, which was the old ice pond. Uh, it's ringed with enormous pieces of granite, cut granite around the uh, edge of the pond. The pond embankments, the pond <coughs> shoreline will be restored stabilized and then as you can see uh, in exchange for the rerouting of some of that uh, the stormwater the water on the water course as well as filling of those two small pockets of wetland we will be expanding uh, the pond to the east to the west as a, uh, a new marsh and uh, and swamp uh, wetland area um, what's happened to the pond over the years is there like I say there's a, that channel coming down from Glen Rock is, has been eroded so that a lot of that sediment and stone and um, um, gravel end up in the uh, in that western part of the pond. So we'll be stabilizing that and then we'll be reconstructing that western edge of the pond as a wetland uh, with some excavation um, and replanting in order to uh, create wetland area um, which will then filter out most of that um, erosion as it comes down the site before it enters the pond and the pond will be restored as part of that um, that part of the project. We've completed a tree survey on the property. Um, we're in the process of assessing the number of trees that will have to be cut down and then as part of the landscape plan and new wetland uh, mitigation plan, we'll be coming back to the board with, with um, 
those kinds, those numbers in terms of trees to be cut, new trees to be planted, and mitigation, et cetera. Um, Mark mentioned that we've gone through some of the initial uh, assessments for the property, and we're looking at a uh, $1 million um, revenue to the town, both for, to the town of Yorktown as well as to the school district. Um, those numbers will be forthcoming as well as we complete our reports. Um, and also the adaptive reuse of the uh, Captain Underhill building. We're working with um, our cultural resource specialist and, the ch and SHPO in order to uh, work through that plan for the property. I think unless there's questions, that's all I have for now. Good evening, uh, Rich D'Andrea from Collier's Engineering and Design. Uh, we are the traffic consultant for the project. Uh, so we've done a preliminary traffic analysis for, for the development and, and what the potential impacts would be. Initially, we've just focused on, on the immediate vicinity of the site, looking at uh, the 118 Underhill uh, intersection, uh, the Rochambeau Drive, and uh, Glen Rock Street and obviously the access into and out of the, the development. Um, as far as traffic volume data, we've actually have some, some pretty good historical data here, dating back to even 2018 from prior studies we've done, but we've also collected new traffic volume data from tw in 2019, 2020, and, and most recently in 2021, uh, just to make sure that we have a good representation of what the traffic volumes are in the, in the area, especially considering the recent COVID changes with traffic volumes in the last couple of years. So, so we think we have a pretty good handle on what the traffic scenario situation is in this area. Um, using that data, like I said, we've, we've projected uh, to the future build out of the development and looked at what the traffic, potential traffic impacts are uh, associated with it. Um, uh, the, the key thing here is, you know, a good portion, the majority of the development is resident, residential. We see a lot of that traffic going to and from the, uh, the Taconic State Parkway. Um, so a lot of it won't go necessarily into town in the peak hours anyway. Um, and when you look at residential development, you're looking at about 0.7 to 0.75 trips per dwelling unit for the, the development. So all, you know, and the key, the key thing here that we see is, as, as a potential issue is the intersection at uh, Underhill and, and 118. I think everybody knows that in the afternoon that there's times where that can back up on Underhill coming down from the Taconic. It's a, a known issue there. Um, when you look at that intersection, there's about 1,500 vehicles that go through that intersection during the peak hours. Uh, we're estimating that we would attribute about 50 to 60 trips to that intersection during those peak hours, which is only about 3% of the, the total volume at that intersection. So that's important to note. Um, we've talked about that there's a connection to Beaver Ridge. We have the two access points out to Underhill. Where, so th that allows us to kind of disperse the traffic uh, to the roadway network a little bit. And, and, and we, we think that's, that people that are going to certain points in the town may use the Beaver Ridge exit. <coughs> they may come through out to Underhill. Um, and and that, like I said, disperses the traffic more than, than might be typical. Um, so based on our analysis, uh, we, we've noted some, some initial improvements that, that we think should be considered or, or made as part of the project. Uh, first and foremost, um, there's some, some, some site distance improvements at Rochambeau Drive, both for our access and for Rochambeau Drive, just some clearing pruning of tree, uh, trees or limbs. Uh, same thing up at Glen Rock Street. I think that's just kind of a combination of, of our access and, and, um, and the, the trees in between that and Glen Rock Street to improve sight distance for both of those intersections. Um, I'm going to just move down here. So, so we talked about the connection through, through to Beaver Ridge. That's what this plan is kind of showing, some of the, the pedestrian improvements and, and traffic control at that location there. Um, that'll be further detailed as part of the project but and the site plans, but those are the, just some of the recommendations with stop signs and, and uh, pedestrian crosswalks at, the, at those locations there. 
and then especially accommodating people to and from that senior center. Uh, oops, sorry, too fast. The other thing that we're proposing um, is a pedestrian crosswalk across uh, Underhill there at the main access to the project. Uh, this kind of serves two, two purposes. Uh, all the, cross, the sidewalks along Underhill are on the opposite side of the road from the project. Uh, so anybody that wants to get down to like town hall that walking they would have they would want to cross up at this location uh, What we're proposing is to install what's called a rapid Rectangular rapid flashing beacon signs. They're push button activated. So when you push the button the lights flash yellow to alert cars that somebody's crossing the street So that's what would be we're proposing at those locate at that crosswalk location with advanced appropriate advanced signage and obviously, like we talked about, there's some queuing that can occur from the 118 intersection here. So we were also proposing to install a do not block the box striping and signage for the driveway here to allow people to get in and out. Also, same thing up at, at Rochambeau Drive. Um, so, and then this signage and the, and the rapid flashing beacon can also help to slow people down along this, this section of the roadway. Um, the other thing that we're also looking at, and it's noted on here, is modifying existing traffic signal and actuation. So we anticipate that there may be some need for some improvements at that location to upgrade the traffic signal to provide improved actuation um, and connectivity for the state to be able to monitor that, that intersection. So we would, we would propose to provide that to the, the state and what other, whatever else they might require for that intersection. Um, we think that the improvements that kind of are detailed on this plan, uh, along with the fact that we have the connection to Beaver Ridge, kind of offsets the overall impact of the development at full build out. Uh, we do, obviously, as we said, there's some there's potential concerns at the, the main intersection at 118 here, and the, the applicant is willing to provide a contribution to that intersection to future improvements. Um, but like I said, we're only we only project to be about three percent of the, the traffic at that that intersection, and we think we can map, mitigate our overall impact. But knowing that there is a concern, uh, potentially with other developments that may come in, we're willing to provide a a, uh, a contribution to the overall potential future improvement at that location, which may involve other lane geometry or other improvements such as that. Um, and I think that's. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, if there's any l potential land dedication to uh, accommodate those potential future improvements, whatever they might be, the applicant would also consider providing some additional lands there as well. So I think that's the, the full extent of what I have to say. So if you have any questions. Oh, Rich? Yeah. So, Rich, <clears throat> I, I see you being one of the big three questions we get when we go to a public information or a public hearing mm -hmm. at some point. Right, it's going to be density, traffic, and I think the historic nature of this. Um, with the town board's approval of these overlay zones, obviously there's going to be a great attraction to the town now. Um, I don't know how familiar with everything that uh, has been kind of floating out there as yep. proposals, mm -hmm. but this intersection and the connection to the Taconic in, in every direction is right in the middle of that. We try to look at things holistically, mm -hmm. right? So measure it to Carpenter's rule, measure twice, cut once. I'm absolutely convinced that that intersection with the other proposed developments around the area is going to be heavily impacted. Have you taken any of those other developments into consideration? We, we have taken to the best of our ability, knowing that nothing's concrete at the moment to into consideration those other developments and that is part of our analysis that's part of why we're saying we agree that there's potentially something that has to happen at that intersection <clears throat> and we're willing to part participate to be part of it um, but we don't see that it's just this one project that, <clears throat> that I, I hear what you're saying yep. I don't mean to cut you off but I could assure you that with everything that's shown coming forward to the town mm -hmm. that that intersection is going to be impacted yeah. so i don't think there's a question of future yeah projects there i just I'm, want to be open up front mm -hmm. with this so I, I i think we really need to dig into the weeds 
on some of these other approvals that are coming our way because there is no question that that intersection along with others are going to be yep. impacted and i also you know i i know there's a lot of public proposed public facilities there the pond the ice pond the the senior center um depending on what time of day and what's going on there i'm sure there's going to be impacts there too right uh you know if you go to uh where the planning department is now in the the beautiful building they have there there's not even close to enough parking for that building all right so we're guilty of our own uh not you know it's an older building but you get what i'm saying mm -hmm. so i think as we move forward with this you know the other developments that have been even if they're you know yeah. You know, pen on, on trace at this point. Right. That's got to be looked at. Yeah. And I, I, again, our our traffic study will ultimately take into consideration, you know, everything that is definitely out there and we, what we can project. You know, what we've done so far is a preliminary analysis and we've taken into consideration what we, at the time, you know, at the time it was done, what we, we knew. And, and we can certainly look at what's there right now what's out there right now and and certainly take that into consideration i think we're really gonna have to dig into that i know the town board uh very appropriately back a few months or maybe longer than that now got uh they hired or they had three different consultants to look at traffic i i think that's something we're definitely going to want to pull here uh the mid block crossing with uh you know i've seen that mm -hmm. i've seen that where i work I don't know if that's, you know, I think that's something we really got to look at. Yep. Um, but I, again, you know, moving forward, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure we're going to see at each one of these meetings because you're going to be one of the big three. Yeah, you're going to see my, either myself or you're going to see Phil Greeley. One of the two of us. All right. <laughs> so there's going to be, a, I could assure you from what I'm reading in the papers about the historic nature of the project, the density, and the traffic. Yep. There will be a lot of questions. I'm sure there will. And, and it's typical of most projects right so without question yeah but i think we really yeah absolutely really I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from and and we will certainly look to do the best to the best of our ability to do what we can to account for everything and i think on top of that when you start to look at you know the development you know the historic end of this has come up and the, i know as part of that you have the walls the existing layout even on the opposite side of the street you know that wall appears to be quite old so we really have to be sensitive to that too. Mm -hmm. You know, some of what I'm reading and hearing is, you know, Yorktown's mm -hmm. motto, the progress with preservation. I, I've heard and seen people actually are saying that as much as we got grilled when the uh, Lowe's or Costco went in, that that is, you know, they, they appreciate the way that was done. And I know there was a tremendous amount of infrastructure work done on the traffic. Yep. You know, I know your group, Phil Greeley, yep. did. I was very heavily involved in that myself. There was two parts. Yep. Honestly, this area here with the traffic, you know, anybody that's driven there, and I'm sure everybody here has, know that it could be troublesome at times. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I understand. I, I actually know it well because I grew up in Yorktown also. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I know that. I so know. You and Greeley are. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you have intimate knowledge of yep, what some absolutely. of these concerns are. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. I, yeah. and I, you may or may not be the right person, but has there been thought of getting foot traffic across 118 towards like the, towards the Caremont building and so forth? Because right now on the plan, I don't see any way for somebody that a pedestrian to leave this property and get across. So at the moment, I've been going down to Allen Avenue. Right. So so at the moment we have two two alternatives. Right. You you could use this crossing to get to down to. 118 and cross at the intersection here and then you could get over to Caremount at that basically right outside here right the other option would be to go out through beaver ridge out down to allen avenue and across there at the moment yeah that, that's what's currently proposed i just want to pick up on what rob is saying because that's a very important concept for me as i was going through these materials i was thinking okay this is one piece as our chairman was saying, of the entire overlay district that's now involving the entire downtown area. And if you do this all by itself without considering the impacts 
on the other properties that may come into the district at some point in the future, we're doing ourselves a disservice. What, one of the things that jumped out at me, and I think I mentioned it at an earlier hearing, was that there is parking along 118 where there should be community connections of some sort. There should be sidewalks over there. There should be some sort of an integration between this corner and other properties in town. Crossing 118 is, is certainly one aspect of that, but if that building were shifted over towards 118 and then that, you know, parking becomes some sort of a more of pedestrian oriented, some sort of a connection that you can even build upon in the future as other properties come into this overlay district, uh, it would go a long way in addressing those concerns and also keeping ourselves in, in the midst of what the, the larger downtown is gonna look like at some point. So this is a very, the way it's presented to me is very isolated right now. It, it's, it's all by itself and, and there's no potential for, you know, even if it takes 20 years for these things to come into fruition, I would hope that we would be able to consider those types of possibilities going forward. Because that, I believe, is the overall goal of the overlay district is to pull this area into a different level of use, a different level of connectedness, to expand the downtown area in, in a way that's, that's user-friendly and, and not, you know, cut up into separate mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah, I think we have to. What was the rating of that, of the grade of that intersection as it exists? As it exists today? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you look at it as an overall level of service, it's actually only like a level of service C, which is actually pretty good. <laughs> what you do, what you realize have to realize is in the peak hour, and especially when you're in the PM when you're coming down Underhill, that's where your delays are. The other the other approaches don't really experience that significant of delay, so your overall level of service comes down. In the peak hour when you're coming down Underhill, you could you could experience a level of service F right now, right? Exactly. As it is, good. as it is, right. right. So, but when you look at it as an overall intersection, the other delays on the other approaches where there aren't significant delays bring the level of service to a better level of service. So, but I, we obviously we know that the, the underhill is the key approach there, in, especially think, in the PM. As I think everybody is in agreement at this point, there's a lot coming. I mean, there's yep. a proposed hotel, there's other, you know, residential mm -hmm. developments that, and we're hopeful that Yorktown becomes very popular. Right, with some of these things, but it's got to be done responsibly. Right. And that's the key here. We don't, you know, like Aaron said, you know, right now you're looking at this one piece. It, it's got to go way beyond. Yeah. And, and I, can, I can tell you, we, we've looked at what potentially could be done at that intersection. You know, could we widen it to provide left turn lanes, put a right turn lane? Um, is there some other alternative type intersection, like a roundabout that we could yeah. put in there? I mean, these are all things that we've considered. Um, but it, it's a function of, you know, how do we get it built, right? I so. get it. And you guys also looked at our other favorite intersection down the road from here. You know, your group looked at how that could be improved. Right. So you have a lot of knowledge of what yeah. goes on in the area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we have to be very sensitive to that. Yep. Anything else? Where's the uh, commercial space located? Um, the commercial space is located... Uh, in the in this portion of the apartment buildings on the first floor. Okay. That that rectangle there. Yeah, that would be the commercial space. That would be the entire eleven thousand square feet. That's the eleven thousand square feet. Yeah. And Joe, when we went out there, we all did a site walk some Le quite a while ago. Probably it was eight. it was very cold. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we had all the boards out there. Yeah. That fire road appeared to be very wet. Right. So, you know, as that, that fire road, that the existing fire road, as, <coughs> as Steve explained, that was, that was constructed as, um, <coughs> as part of the Beaver Ridge. So there's an easement through this property <coughs> and it was constructed as part of the Beaver Ridge project as, far, as emergency access or secondary access to that property. <coughs> so when they constructed that, they basically used on-site materials, so hence what 
what Steve was talking about, those little pockets there, that's where they took the material from to construct that road. So the road itself became a dam, in a sense, of water flowing from west to east, and then uh, began to pond there, eventually saturating the roadway itself also. also. It's not, it's not a, um, in a sense, a traditional roadway where it's, you know, it's got a heavy-duty base and, it, and, it, and it's, um, you know, traffic-rated type surface. So it eventually just started to deteriorate. Uh, you know, it's probably, what is it, over 30 years old, maybe more? And as I also mentioned, there is a culvert under that fire road, and, and the sediment and erosion that's come down the hill from, from Glen Rock is clogged up that upstream end of that. So a lot of that water now goes straight across the fire road. So then again, you're going to see it's very wet out there. So that water was originally intended to flow to the ice pond, as you call yes. it, and it's not now? Well, it eventually gets there because it's down, the ice pond is downhill. But, but it, whatever pipes are in the area are... The, the clogged pipe kind of stops the water from getting through and staying in the channel, so it kind of backs up and then overflows across the, the, cha the, uh, the fire road as more sheet flow until it gets to the other side, and then when you get there, you see another well-defined channel again where it then heads down to the ice pond. So who's currently responsible for the maintenance of that pipe? The one that's clogged. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, my guess would be Beaver Ridge because it's their access road, but I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't know the, the answer to it. Are there any easements or anything else that we got to worry about? <coughs> there are no easements that would preclude the development, but a, a, the easement that you're describing right there, like a utility or a drainage easement, yeah. is something we could look into. But there's nothing that would prevent uh, us <coughs> utilizing or implementing the footprint that we're showing you. Okay. So I, I think it's important to get that cleaned up to see what's actually going on out there. Sure. All right? Mm -hmm. And if, it, if that gets clean and it starts working differently, it's going to tell a different story. Okay. And just one note, and it may have been mentioned before, and I apologize <coughs> if it was, the what um, – Steve is referring to as the old farm road mm. is actually an emergency access to Beaver Ridge. Fire so I just want to make sure yeah. that everyone is aware of that. Right. Yeah, it's one and the same. What I'm talking about, the emergency access road, it's the farm road that Steve was talking about. Is that considered passable right now? When we were out there, it, it well, I mean, it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's, 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 it's probably supposed to be. <laughs> uh, honestly, probably there's probably somewhere that it should have been maintained a little better than it has. Right. But I think it was, uh, if it was an old farm road, it was probably modified to handle emergency vehicles. Right. When we were on a site visit, I guess it was last year, I went all the way up to the end where that little turnaround is after the last townhouse. Yes. And in walking up there, there were, seemed to be wet areas that are not necessarily identified over here that have nothing to do with the Beaver Ridge Access Road. And the other point I note, it's hard to find, but the there are like five, five of the townhouse buildings are within the 100-foot wetland buffer. I mean, there's a lot of activity going on in that uh, wetlands and wetlands buffer that you did identify on one of the maps, you know, one of the drawings. Yeah, the wetland buffers you refer to are for those two small pockets of wetland that are proposed to be filled. So, you know, and the, the pond. And the pond, sure, absolutely. Um, as far as the uh, the cul-de-sac there, the turnaround at the end, we went up there and several times looking, and all the the, the water that enters the site from up there is entirely storm driven. When there's a rain event, water comes, there's a couple of catch basins up there that catch it, bring it under Glen Rock, and discharge it onto the site. But other than that, there's no base flow up there. There's no condition that would define these, these parts of the site as being regulated wetlands. There is yeah, water yeah, I'm not sure if it's a wetland or not. I just know it was wet. Yeah. There was a lot of standing yeah. water up there. So I know there are three indications that you're looking for, and so I'm not sure what, which that's, of the three are up there. It's certainly all runoff and drainage from above our site that would have to be contended with in, in terms of the drainage plan for the whole site. There were areas where you couldn't walk. I mean, it was that, you know, unless you wanted to get. I mean, certainly, as, as you mentioned, there are criteria for determining whether it's regulated as wetland or not. And uh, 24 hours after a heavy rain event, it's going to be wet. 72 hours, it's, you know, it's, it's dried out by then. So it doesn't really meet that criteria. Again, it's certainly drainage and runoff onto the site that we have to contend with as we plan the drainage for the whole property. And can you talk to the, the existing building? So just for the purpose of the historic nature of it, 
Can you give us some background and what they're going to be doing to that building? Well, I can say that the the building as a standalone concept, I think I want to look at the whole site for a moment. The buildings surrounding the standalone Captain Underhill house are in disrepair. Those buildings are condemnable not to be saved. What we are proposing, and we'll show later, is that the architectural design for the new construction is modeled after the existing Underhill Captain Underhill structure, so that you're, we're going to be repairing and adaptively reusing the Captain Underhill structure that's going to blend in with the architectural, uh, the new features of new buildings for the remainder of the project. That doesn't really answer your question yet. I'm getting there. So <laughs> I, I understand. So, so I just, I don't want this to be thought of as Underhill sticks out like a sore thumb now with sort of a modern project behind it. The whole project now is going to be sort of a seamless, uh, I, I hate to use this word twice and differently, but adaptation of the Underhill design. As far as the Underhill structure itself is concerned, I don't, I'm not sure what's going in there, quite frankly, but I know that the structure itself is going to be preserved as you see it now. Uh, and, and then whatever is in there, it's something of maybe a concept of a coffee shop or an office, something along those lines. But we want to develop that as this project moves forward with every iteration every time we're in front of you. But I think it's important, I forgot to mention this in the outset, that the, the Underhill restoration is a piece of the theme for the architectural theme for the entire site. And the, the uh, building that's proposed, I guess, for the town, it's going to be a... Uh, the uh, senior center? Yes. The senior center. Yeah, it's not, it's not part of this project. You know, we're not designing that. Or, <laughs> so that's separate from this. <laughs> Right. The, the parking is theoretically going to be right. on their property, but the, the building itself will be built and constructed on Beaver Ridge property. Okay. And that town's handling that. I'm sorry? The town's handling that end of it? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 uh, via separate agreement with Beaver Ridge. Okay. No, I wouldn't consider it totally separate. So the things that happen on this site yeah. will affect that. So you just have to keep that in mind. Not in a, in a great substantial way. But I think you have to keep that in mind so that whatever is put on the ground on this site is married to what we expect to be on that site. Right. And do we have an idea of what that building is going to look like? Or how big it's going to be and, you know, the needs? Yes, we do. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the part, well, the parking, w this site will be providing the lion's share, if not all, of the required parking for that building. A lot, the parking lot that's <coughs> adjacent. Up in the corner. So, yeah. And is it that parking that makes that project uh, able to go forward? At present, it is, yeah. Just trying to wave and go. Right. Joe, you have underground parking under the building here, right? Yes. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Underneath the condominium building and the apartment building, there's going to be underground parking. <coughs> underground where? Underneath the... the the condominium and the apartment building. <clears throat> I have one other question about the apartments. Um, I know you mentioned that, um, if I remember off the top of my head, it's, on my, it's in my notes somewhere, but um, the townhouse is going to be three to four bedrooms. Three and four bedrooms, mm -hmm. correct. And uh, the condos are going to be one and two bedrooms. Correct. And what are the apartments going to be? The same, one and two bedrooms. Y are you interested in seeing a the architecture absolutely okay uh, i'm gonna ask paul galero the the uh, property owner to come up and present that how are you hi good good unfortunately our architect was unable to make it tonight he's um he's based in virginia he's based in virginia and uh, but he will be up at the next meeting okay but what, what we'll do is we'll flip through some of the architecture and um i'll try to describe what each one is Okay, but I'm sure he'll give you more detailed when he comes. Well, if he's a historic architect, Virginia is a good place to be coming out. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so this is the this would be the ground floor of the apartment building, which shows the retail space. This is the retail space here, and then behind it is the uh, uh, parking, the un the uh, underbuilding parking. So that's the building looking um, as if the 
uh, Captain Underhill House is not there. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just so you could see what it looks like. So that you see the lower level on the right is the retail. Okay, that's on the right side. And how the grade slope, slopes up to the first floor level of the apartment building, which is on the uh, west side. Okay. So your back is to Underhill Avenue there, looking at the apartments. And this is the condo building. Um, access to the garage is from the right and uh, slopes there again from west to east. Okay, the, we have two different types of townhouses. Um, the top one is a uphill townhouse, uh, which is basically basement and two-story. And then the downhill townhouse, which is a um, first floor and it's, it's actually a one and a half story in basement. So garages are on the first floor and um, there's a uh, basement in each one of those units. Walk out. Walk out, yes. So that you can see with the architecture, it all ties in. Yeah. That, that's all that was in there. Okay. And that's what we have for tonight to show you architecture-wise, unless you have any questions. The apartments are going to be uh, uh, market rate. Yes. Any subsidized housing in there? No. Uh, as we, you know, as I said, a considerable number are going to be dedicated to, to senior living. Any no. projection on a potential uh, cost price of the apartments? Uh, no, the, of the townhouses and the condos. Um, I would say the townhouses are going to be in the um, six to sevens and up. Um, the condos are probably going to be in the four to six range. Yeah. Joe, do you have a sense of the number, given the number of units and bedrooms and so forth, estimated number of residents for this area? Um, Probably have two to at least two to two to the house here. Right. right. Something like Our preliminary calculations. There we go again. <laughs> I've got to get LASIK or something. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. Preliminary calculations are 321 new residents and 23 school age children. That's where we are today. Thank you. And how do you earmark this? What, how do you handle the senior distinction? Are we still able to do that? Um, which ones are designated? Yeah. Okay. So we have the condominium building will be um, 55 and older, restricted. So that distinction is still available to us in, in New York to make a distinction like that in selling sure. units? Okay. So the condos are going to be 55 and older, you said? Yes. That's, that's extremely young. <laughs> I just drop it just a second. Anybody's yeah. young after me. <laughs> yeah, any questions? Yeah, I'm shocked because I'm almost, I'll, I'll be, I got, I, got, I got a few years before I hit 55, <laughs> but we're talking like it's 55 and over is, you know, over there somewhere. And, uh, well, it is over here. So, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, well, at least it's not over here yet. Well, it's right there. Well, it's like well, over, here. Here. Never mind. over here for some of us. I can tell you one thing, and these are seniors I talk to, they all welcome something that, where they can downsize their house yep. and move in and be close to town, Yeah. walk to the, walk to the, uh, wherever they want to walk and the pond and everything is, it sounds to me like the seniors citizens are going to enjoy that. Any, any other questions? Is it going to be a lot to absorb? Oh boy. Yeah. All right. I'm sure there's going to yeah. be many meetings on this. Uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. the team's going to be important as we move forward. Uh, we are going to have to talk to John about our consultants and, you know, environmental and clearly traffic to work with Rich. Um, you know, I think density, wetlands, the historic nature of the project, traffic, 
and the holistic look at the area, right? That's going to be a key thing because there's a lot going on. There's a lot kind of out there. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't want to do things twice. We want to make sure it's right the first time. Anything else at this point? John? Nothing for me. Probably probably want to get the consultants moving on their proposals. Yeah. So we're not... We're not sitting back waiting, waiting for that. No, I think I, I'm sure. John's we ready? To do, are we, we ready to do that yet? We, I think we got. They, I think they got to look at more of what's out there. Yeah. You know, and I think we'll hear from them as we move forward. But you know, I think John probably better than anybody's got a list of the potential developments out there. Well, I think there's a process behind that, right? That the town board has to request the proposal from the consultants. Well, we can request it. We can request okay. the proposal. Town board so has to authorize. There is a process, so if we can get that going, we're not saying we want them, you know. To I'm not sure. Sort of review the project. You know what I mean? I think we're still in the. Aren't we still in the conceptual stages a little bit here, in terms well, of some yeah, of the comments yeah. that yeah. I heard tonight, including some that I made, before we actually dig in with consultants on specific things at this point. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that. And, but you do have a full application in with an EAF. Um, so there is enough to initiate that that aspect. But I'm just saying there's a process behind getting them, uh, <clears throat> you know, getting a proposal from them. We don't want three waiting. We, we don't want to be three months down the road waiting for a proposal from the consultant well, so that we can get that going. We understand what you're saying offline. We'll, we'll discuss it with, okay. with John. Okay. That's all. All right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Mark? No, that, that was, unless you have any other questions, we'll work with your staff, uh, John and Robin, and, and the attorneys, Adam and, and Jim, and hopefully. Uh, I think it's important that off the cuff to get the fire department involved, building inspector, you know, for that fire access. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, and again, it's been referred yeah. to everybody, so <clears throat> we'll go from here. Okay. Yeah, we can engage them. Uh, you know, with, with staff, I mean, the fire road, even what you heard tonight about the condition of it now, I mean, we think it's a big plus we bring to the project, but there's a lot to look at. We yeah, do. especially with impacts. I mean, you got basically what equates to a four-story building. I'm sure it's going to be designed with all the current codes. Oh, of course. But, again, it's better to bring them in early. Oh, yeah. You know, just like, you, just like you're talking about mm -hmm. with the consultants. Yeah. You know, all right? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Joe, Joe, one question. Do you have any idea of... Uh, Completion shovel to uh, doorbell. How long time would it take? Yeah, time span. I'm not sure. Paul. And my grandkids going to be eligible for the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Your grandkids what? Fifty. Forty-five. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree with you on that, boy. And, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate your time. Question. I guarantee you won't see anything there before five years. It's a shame. No. It's awful. It's awful. It's five nice. years. It's, again, it's how much what? they put into it's the up in Mohegan. Oh, rest room. Rest room. Like, look at everything. We refer to this, gonna this run go to other agencies now. I'm sure it's referred to everybody at this point, right? Is this going to conservation yet? I would... Yeah, okay. all right, so. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, Robin's hitting the button. Was the mute? Yes. It was a mobile for a long time. It's right across from, right across from, uh, like, where. Let's give everybody a minute. I figured that was yeah, used to be. It was Charlie Brown's for a while. Is what? Battery. My battery's going to run out if you need you to see. You plug? <laughs> where am I going to plug it? I'm sure Robin's got a plug. <laughs> <laughs> you, you weren't fully charged before yeah, you got it. Yeah, you have a plug? It, it was it's like charged. like the phone. Do you have a plug? Because we've got a. No, uh, I have. I have one, but I have an have extension cord. Yeah, I have an extension. It's going to be facing no, the That's okay. Right. Yeah, it's just a. Well, I don't. We don't really need. Uh, there's yeah, not much right. we have to discuss the on home side, cards. My just, question is, how do you put the comments you made into practice? Yeah. 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 Practice. No, no, no. It's all right. It's just. No, no, dear. Please, because anything you say, you could tell us everything you want. None of it goes on the record. You got. You want to make sure 
Is and I know you guys will pay attention to the agendas because when it comes to the public informational hearing, which will be the first step, which probably is not too far away, you're going to want to and list out your questions on paper, submit it, but also ask it in the form of a question because the question has to be answered. Yeah, you're going to want to get it to the planning. Board. I've been in the arts town for many years, 50 years, and I've seen it grow from, you know. But now, I want to get out on the court. I, I, I have to, like, dear God, yeah. no, can we'll I get, we'll get that out on the table. And that's something and we're I definitely going to look at. Down, cross the street, yep. right. and turn around at town it's gonna hall, be a little bit yep. different. It's and enter so I can be safe. Okay. okay. And then in the meantime, I'm looking at the floor, right on red. I've spoken to Dave Paganelli. Okay, so do me a favor, just get all that in an email and, you know, get it to us. Thank you for listening to me for two minutes. No problem. Thank you. you have a great night. Okay. Where are we up to now? There's no one left. Next on the uh, agenda, we have Home and Heart. This is a discussion of a site plan, locations 1750 East Main Street. Yeah, um, I mean, there's really not much to talk about. We submitted a lighting plan and a landscape yep. plan that's been referred to a back uh, it's going going to a back at their next meeting yeah um, that's the only new I news for you guys um, now unless you want to talk about the the landscaping and lighting but so the, the March 4th memo from the Conservation Board they have no objections with no this objections. Moving forward. Right. so so I'll, I'll save the presentation for you know, once we're through a back, uh, and then we come back to you guys for the formal public hearing. Okay, good. All right. we, yep. we, got, we got some architecture on this? Um, basically, what you had what seen had before. before. Okay. So, All right, so there's work to be done then, I guess. And just as we say that, I got the... <laughs> <laughs> Low battery. You put that up there, man. Come on. <laughs> it's, That's like a it's a screen <laughs> saver. Screen saver. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Good night, guys. See ya. Take care. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have Lakeview Estates, lot number six. Location, uh, or the address is 1102 Gambelli Drive. How are you? How are you? Good. Yourselves? Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we'll just... Names for the record. So I'm Greg Chapel. I'm the property owner. Um, well, long time resident of the area. I've been here since 79. So I think that qualifies me as a county. Um, <laughs> I, I, we're building this as a private residence for my wife and I. Um, this is the last lot in the Gambelli Drive Lakeview Estates. Um, and I think the main purpose of us coming here is trying to assess the feasibility of us being able to encroach on the um, conservation or the wetlands that have been delineated here on the building envelope side of the rock. Um, part of what we really enjoy about the property is a conservation area and we're looking to put the house up and a little bit over the top of the rock so that we can look down. Um, in, in an effort to try to sort of limit the uh, impact in that conservation or wetlands area, and I think that delineation is something that's a little unclear. Um, it's a flat roof house, so all of our drainage is pulled back into the envelope, um, and we're not doing any soil disruption. Um, we are attaching to the rock, um, but that would be the only thing. That and some trees just outside of the drip line of the house. So, so this is up. High looking down. Um, it it sort of cascades across the property. And we have architecturals that we can show. 
um, but it cascades up, so you sort of have a living room kitchen that runs along the top of the rock, allows us to have glass that looks down. Um, it's a fairly modest house, 3,000 square feet. Um, and it's just the delineation of the, uh, and we've, been, we've been through building, so that's, that's what the, the house looks like. That's nice looking. So we're, we're using the stone base as a way of, and the foundation as a way of extending the, um, I think that was, this is the front of the house. So you'll, you'll have a stone base um, that runs off of the wall down as a foundation to give, because it is a flat roof and the, the height, we're trying to give a little scale and break it down. Um, it's stucco, um, it's a light colored, either gray or white. Um, with a wooden slat on the back and then a stone um, that wraps down and then provides a screen across the driveway and then this will be the pathway that walks in. So it's almost gated coming in. Um, and then this all cascades down to Gambelli and we're looking sort of to break tradition in Gambelli and, and do a wildflower front yard rather than grass. Do you have a survey showing the location of the house? We do. We can see that. Is that the site plan? No. Plan for this. So that's the that's the way the house. How the, that's how the, the house sits up on the rock. Um, we're looking to sort of flatten with some pavers, a uh, patio area up there. Um, it does provide a pretty nice vista that looks down into the stream, which, you know. And where is the conservation easement on this? The conservation easement runs right through, right along the, the uh, this side of the rock. Part of the rock goes the line goes through part of the rock outcropping, right? It, the, most of the rock cropping is within the within conservation it, right. of the wetlands. Um, I think part of where we've been, and we've had a preliminary discussion, um, is that that conservation area, it was called a conservation area in the original development. In the first time it was deeded, and in every time it's ever been addressed, it's been addressed as a wetlands area. It's, it's written in the first deed, and we have that of um, wetlands conservation, and then it refers you to the Title 24 for New York State and the, the town, which I think is 146, 149. Um, it was actually the old New York State code. There was a revision since the original deed, but then it's always, it always refers you back to the existing wetlands codes as far as trying to do it. Um, and some of the more fine planning of the Lakeview Estates shows it very clearly is a 100 foot buffer. Um, working with um, Steve to do wetlands, we went through and did a walkthrough in the wetlands to make sure that we understood the relationship of that line and it really is sort of set off the 100 foot setback off the wetlands. Um, but I guess we're, we're sort of, we're, we're here just to get some guidance and understanding of how to go forward with um, the ability and the proper way of sort of addressing the encroachment that we're proposing. It, what part of the structure is within the conservation easement? Any? Yes, it is. So the structure itself, the living space that you're building, is encroaching into the conservation easement somewhat, right? Yeah. Did I lose okay. it? It is. It's the living room. It's there's a there's a single story living room yeah. kitchen great room yep. area, and there's a little bit of the second bedroom that, that's up top with a we're using a part of that lower. So it's side. several. It's a matter. But it is developed. It, there is an improvement on top of it. So it's in a matter of several feet or seven feet or something like that. It's um. Yeah, you can that line right. The encroachment sort of sits this line here. Um, it's it's about it, it's maybe 450 square feet of 
encroachment. Of encroachment okay. of the, it's probably an acre and an eight, or 1.8 acres in that conservation of the 2.3. Yeah, and I noticed that part of the boulder or the rock outcropping you intend to use as a patio? We would like to be able okay. to, to pave it. So to what extent do you need to modify the rock outcropping to flatten it appropriately to create the patio? I think with the way that we've built the structure is the structure is built up and above the, the rock or the only place we would be disturbing the rock is where we would be um, making the pin connection with the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, all the floor joists are raised. There's really a mechanical space that's below that. That allows us then to, um, we'll end up flattening, um, the, essentially using a, like a, a concrete to bring the, the rock up and not really chip down the rock. We're not gonna remove the rock. Mm. You're not going to remove the rock. Okay, I saw it. And that's why we went, we went with this design because you know, we really want to see that piece and we didn't know quite what the conservation was because it's not described until you go back to the original piece. So you're not chipping any of the rock? You're actually going to bring the patio up to meet or, or slightly above the top of the rock yes. until it meets the, that little promontory piece of it. That's right. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, so you'll have, a, you'll have a, you, you'll just have a couple inch walk out between the, the, the living room kitchen floor and the patio. Right, of course. That also allows us to have a little bit of structure where we can use rebar and potentially make a beam along the side to, to support right. railings. And but in terms of the rock outcropping uh, and the patio, you'll have somewhat of a, a wall that you build up, right? A little bit, yep. A little bit. And it will vary, of course, as you go around, right? That's right. And it looked as though you were going to follow one of the contours as the outline? We, we will follow it naturally uh, on the side. We'll have to pick something out there. Um, part of the, the rock outcropping as you go back to the back of the property is higher. Mm -hmm. We'll leave that. That'll actually come up and out of the patio. The majority of the patio um, sits forward of that on the lower areas. And the rock itself slopes down quite a bit from the front to the back. There's probably eight feet of slope on that. So. So Part of that's like why we use the, the, that stone foundation that'll tie in, mm -hmm. so it sort of keeps a, a continuity of architecture across the front there. It looks very well thought out. Looks like, like Aaron said, it complements what's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's an uh, interesting architectural yeah. problem yes. and an with an interesting architectural solution, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, we really embrace it. We yeah. personally love that piece of property and that stream. I, there, there's eaves overhangs with windows, so we'll actually hear that stream inside the house. That's a big piece of the feature. Right. So as a conservation easement, which are always written about the natural features and resources of the area are not to be disturbed, that's what you have to grapple with here. Um, the rock outcropping, I haven't seen it lately, but I mean, I don't know if it's a a natural feature that the board felt was, so, you know, something uh, as part of the landscape or not. So that's a consideration. I think that in large measure, the conservation easement given these plans was created as Mr. Sh Chapel, Chapel said, uh, related to the wetlands and the wetland buffer. So to the extent that you, if you allow encroachment, um, you'll just really have to figure out and take into account what what the what the easement was intended to do uh, what any any other applications that may you know come in with similar requests might do uh, things of that nature so I think there's also the issue of the differing um, elevations because the first floor elevation was set at somewhere in the 420s, and I think we're looking at an elevation, a first floor elevation here, main, I think, of about seven or eight feet above that. Uh, so that's something that you also have to deal with as well. Uh, I would, and a question for you is, that, you know, the, the deeds should have that note in them. Somewhere they got dropped, I don't know why, but it, I, I it's think still neat. It's still the deeded, I mean, the, the language, this falls in, I think, does fall into the interpretation of the first deed. It's, it's transferred hands three times. It went from the original developer 
and then in 2015 went to the owners that we purchased it from and then it came to us um, each time it's been diluted I, I look back to the first time it went from the developer to the private and that's really where it it does describe it as a wetlands area slash conservation and then it it points to be administered per and it's it cites the uh, the state code and this and the town code um, for wetlands alone and this this and it's just you know what's that line is that line the buffer there, there is some historical maps or drawings that have been submitted to the town for that development where it does show it as a buffer as a hundred foot buffer I think Steve showed it as a uh, went through and we resurveyed it surveyed the boundaries and it's pretty close um, but then you know it, it, but it always shows it as being administered as under those two codes and those are the wetlands codes and so I, in the original I think it was prior to the the rewriting of the statutes and then the statutes have been updated mm -hmm. the platch has the conservation line with meets and bounds did you re reproduce that and overlay that into any of your plans we have you they're, have they're that, shown okay. in there we resurveyed the property um, all the elevations um, at least on the stream side of the property or something that our surveyor has set that we've worked off of um, so all the elevations here have been re reestablished off of our own points um, and we've gone through and done a tree survey at least between our property and the uh, stream which we really you know the certainly I, the only thing we really think of the trees is tr just trying to keep the trees the drip line off the house and protect the structure and yard wise what other development do you have out there I mean how much are you showing past that um, we, we show a permeable pavement and pass this aside. <laughs> Um, so my name is Tessa Uchaite. I'm a professional engineer with uh, DG Engineering. I'm principal there, and I'm a project manager. Um, so let's go to the site plan. In terms of um, uh, utilities, um, uh, this property would require septic, would require well, uh, and stormwater management practices. So in terms of stormwater, we designed uh, numerous, I guess, uh, different uh, low impact development uh, practices. So that would be uh, for the dry, we, we are using uh, the flatter areas for uh, pervious uh, pavers. Then uh, walkway also would be pervious pavers. Then uh, we are using, um, um, let me just make it. We're incorporating uh, right here a, a, a rain harvesting structure that would overflow if it's full uh, to the rain garden. and. Uh, basically this um, ring garden will, would overflow actually to um, sheet flow towards the wetlands area um, but that uh, rainwater would be considered uh, clean rainwater because it's just the roof water water system uh, right so anything that would be more uh, polluted as a um, let's say from the driveway everything would be uh, infiltrated into right there into the dry you know wherever it falls um, so um, other thing that I wanted to show uh, are some pictures and how this would get incorporated into let me see okay so basically um, that's a rock outcrop and that's where the structure would be sitting uh, but the picture that I wanted to show is I think So that, that's the other portion of the house that's not on the outcrop. 
Um, okay, so this would be the picture <laughs> that shows basically the extent of this rock outcrop. And uh, the reason why this is sort of important, just to emphasize on the, on the uh, uh, point that, uh, let's see, where the stormwater r uh, runoff will be draining to. So we have, um, we analyze the watershed. <coughs> And so this would be the watershed that runs through um, when it is developed, I guess, that, that's, that's a house and that's a watershed. So none of it really drains uh, past the rock outcrop. Just, I guess, this portion slowly drains toward the, towards the Gombelli Drive. Most of it uh, drains onto Gombelli Drive and... Uh, portion of this drive is also pervious pavers and it has overflow structure, a catch piece, and so it is uh, designed for the subdivision al already that I guess I'm, I did not really look how, but it seems like it's pervious pavers. And uh, so this is ad added additional, uh, I guess, stormwater features. Um, um, and we are not really relying on it because obviously we have uh, incorporated uh, pavers and uh, uh, previous pavers and uh, you know all kinds of other stormwater features. But uh, in general, that would be uh, the direction where the stormwater would be draining towards the road, not towards the wetlands. Pictures were very helpful. Yeah. So so this rock outcrop. It kind of divides the watershed, and uh, so the entire development um, still pre or post still continues uh, the same flow patterns towards the uh, Gombelli Drive. Uh, some numerous trees would be removed. Uh, for the purpose, of course, to to install this uh, patio. This is the patio. Thank you. And uh, for the purpose of install uh, uh, construction of the septic systems, the septic system was designed and approved uh, for the subdivision and also for the uh, site development by other engineers. So it's, it has approvals. It uh, has valid approvals. Uh, the same go goes for the well. So this exact location, uh, exact location of approved uh, septic and well. I guess that would be about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If any questions, we're here. Yeah, and the one the one feature this does do is the the buildable envelope is really tiny on this, which is the way the subdivision laid it out. It does pull it away from the neighboring house, so I think it makes it still probably one of the closest two houses in that development. Um, but it does certainly give as much breathing space between those two houses as you can have. So there there is a feature to the neighborhood. So what would the steps be here? Where is the protected wetlands on that chart? It um, it really runs right along the side of the the uh, the you can see it come through here. That's a set. That's a hundred foot setback or the wetland. What they that's that's the conservation line, right. which is based on the hundred foot setback. So where. It Where's the wetlands? The wetlands. Itself, yeah. Do we have the, the survey? Wetland would be this, the survey, yeah. The wetlands are down here. Oh, okay. I think I see. So I read the um, previous resolution on this, which imposed the condition. Is there also a note on the map imposing a conservation easement uh, when this was laid out? On the, on the 1997 plat, there is the conservation easement with the note. With the typical conservation so who holds note. that easement the town the town holds the easement created by you so if you feel as though this is something that can move forward you would have to modify this conservation easement i see because the resolution i looked at it really quickly i'm not sure it, res it 
references the easement itself in the resolution. It does reference deed restrictions. And it talks about, I mean, if an activity is permissible, permissible under the wetlands law with a permit and mitigation, it seems that they can do that under the terms of the deed restrictions here. Um, not necessarily under a conservation not easement. Not necessarily though. under the that, easement. So, yeah. And there, there is, so for instance, there is a note in the, well, I think it's the original resolution that no further wetland permits will be approved by the town in this subdivision other than road crossings and things like that. So I see. So it, it's that kind of um, process that went through during the subdivision mm -hmm. that ended up where we are with it today. Now, I think there's something to be said for the fact that it's a rock outcropping that the the drainage is away from the wetlands and the wetland buffer, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think there's a possibility that the conservation easement being laid along the buffer line is really there to protect the wetlands and, and the wetland buffer, particularly mm -hmm. the wetlands. If this encroachment, being that it's on top of the rock outcropping, does not in any way, in, you know, uh, impact those values, then maybe it's something that you can move forward with. It certainly looks that way from what they've shown. Yeah. I mean, the encroachment is such a minuscule. What is it? Encroachment 400 square feet or something? Excuse me? The encroachment is 400 square feet? Did How I, much of the. It, it, I think uh, of the house, but with the patio, it, it's almost 1,000 square feet total. No, but without the patio. It's, it's about 400 square feet. That's what I heard before. And it's all rock. It's all, it's all rock. And, and in, to note on the subdivision here does talk about the soils and, and the protection of, of, that, of, of the water basin more than the, the natural features. But again, it really comes down to, to the consideration of this board, so, which is why we're here presenting for the first time. I, I don't yeah, see a problem. I think it, it's something we would. We can move forward. What are your thoughts? Does this have to go to conservation board? I would think so. Yeah. Have you been before the no, any this other is the board first yet? time. We we've been trying to sort of work towards knowing where to go forward and, and we're we're looking for some guidance on that. So Don, we'll would it be redrawing the we easement need to. line or would it be abandoning the concept of an easement at all? I would say that what has happened in the past is that you've redrawn the conservation easement line. On some, in some cases where it was, you know, a, a small footing for a, a deck that encroached on a corner, you allowed the encroachment. Uh, some of the processes that we've gone through, they, I think they needed to, you know, acknowledge that this will no longer have the same values that the easement originally had. So. But this is in their deed, so you got to make sure it's... And it's yeah. yeah, you don't, you don't want to just... Right. Having the encroachment is not going to be helpful to them. I guess. Right, so you got to change it. <laughs> That's beyond us, though. Yeah, and I mean, I, as a no property owner, I'd like the deed to actually speak more to what the town wants and less about this. It, it, it's a really, it, it's not very good lawyering that went into this. So. You weren't involved, were you? Well, I think our, our conservation law is permissive. I mean, the wetlands law is permissive. It doesn't say you can't do certain things. It says if you do do certain things, then you have to show the consequences to the wetlands and take measures to... Mitigate. You know, mitigate them or avoid Absolutely. them or whatever else. And I think the key element here that, that Joe was talking about with the rock being where it is, the 100-foot distance may not be as significant as it otherwise would be if there was just a clear slope going down into the wetlands. So yeah. I would I would yeah. suggest that you take this concept. I don't, you know, if, if we get the response from the conservation board and you're adequately you know dealing with the consequences of what you're doing i like the concept of what you've got in mind here for the yeah, for this property nice looking plan. i'd like to see it go forward so you want with us the to proper of course yeah, 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 yeah conservation do a referral yeah sure excellent well thank you for your time then. a question who designed the house uh a friend of mine an architect that i've worked with i'm a commercial general contractor so very nice nice, nice. Licensed builder it's well, nice looking. License in California. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Nice Thank project. you. Thank you very much. Luck. Thank you.
that could be quite a piece of property. Yeah, Very beautiful. Nice. All right, next on the agenda, we have the Bellamy subdivision. This is a discussion of a minor subdivision. Address is 379 Halix Mill Road. The one on the corner, the yeah, yeah, the curve. How are you? Good well, evening. How are everybody doing tonight? Good yourself. I'm doing well. So I bring you back the Bellamy subdivision. It's good to see everybody in person this time. I have to tell you, you had when you were on the Zoom, your mic was the best out there. You could hear you, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you were so. It was really? so absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm, well, I'm very glad. prominent. In comparison to everybody else, I I have a loud voice. I don't need a like, you, no. A lot of and, time, so. <laughs> With both of those, things, you projected very well. Right, it came over good. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So we're back here at, on Halix Mill Road. Uh, I've made some revisions to the plan at the request of the planning department. Uh, I will note while you're getting that ready, we have a letter from the superintendent of highways, uh, Dave Paganelli, and he says uh, highway has no problem with the subdivision. Well, that's a big hurdle. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, this this uh, this rendering here has this has uh, a com more of a uh, actually a common driveway. Uh, I've taken. I've taken a 30 foot swath that's, uh, I think it's about 75 feet deep. Uh, it's 15 feet on each, on either side of the property line. Uh, you know, right in this area and essentially uh, made that, it made the first 70 feet or so a common, a common driveway. I think it's 18 feet wide. Uh, it, it minimizes, you know, it, it actually meets the town code uh, for grade and everything. So it'll uh, alleviate some of the, the concerns of the neighbor across the street so that uh, it, it'll, it, it, it'll, it has a, uh, a standing area as you approach the road. So we, uh, and there's also the, the drainage will be picked up. So anything that comes out of our driveway is, uh, is and also our driveway is going to be moved a little bit down the hill just a slight bit so it'll actually probably that'll probably also help us as well his uh it, we he's not going to get the uh the driveway right now is very steep off the side of the road steep right down to it so that's the that was the reason that it probably got any sort of uh any flow in the past was just uh you know it is a bad configuration that we're going to make a lot better uh in a lot of a lot of ways you know including the roadside clearing for the slight distance and everything else if you look there's this uh solid line here by the cursor that's actually the uh the, the proposed new front lot line uh the the hatched area is going to be the uh, dedicated for road purposes to the town 25 feet from the center uh, from the center line of the road uh that uh, there was also uh the planning department has some concerns about uh site easements and when i looked at it after i took the took the uh the road dedication out there i don't there's really not a reason for the for the site easements on the property anymore the where you're back so far uh you're on town property essentially when you're looking for your you're checking your site distance the where the easement would have been displayed in the past is now in the roadway is, is dan he left i just saw him sorry yes. sir. Just walk it's downstairs if you if you if you say that you would like him here, I think he would appear. Let me see if he's in the hallway. I think this is, yeah, this is important, at least on his end. I mean, if it, if you wanted a, a site easement, uh, some sort of a triangle, I don't, we don't have a problem showing one. We would just need a little bit of uh, input as to how much in the, you know, how much we were looking at. Well, you are 
regrading and doing some clearing so that you have the recommended site distance, right? Yes. And I, I mean, the, the clearing is, the, the clearing and grading is necessary, not just for the, the site right. distance, but just the, to get the, okay. to get the driveway in. Right. So then it's, it's really just a matter of uh, maintaining the vegetation in a manner that doesn't uh, obstruct your view. Yes. So will we put that onus on the landowner? I mean, it, it could be a. We, I think the same thing happened on the project you did off of. Uh, that was uh, Stony. That was actually on the corner of Ivy Stony Road. and Ivy, yeah. and it was cutting the the corner. It was yeah. cutting the intersection, the you know, the corner of the yeah. intersection for the roads. So for purposes of maintenance, you could have a note on this plat that requires that that that's those sight lines are maintained from vegetation to obstruct preventing yeah. obstruction of the view this way if the town doesn't get to it it's covered thank you nancy any issues with this application as it currently sits dave signed off on it um yeah i mean the driveway we're clearing we're opening it up so it's twofold it provides site distance for the people leaving the property as well as enhancing uh, the site distance to some degree on Halix Mill Road. So I think the applicant, uh, and, you know, including the widening strip, has really done pretty much, you know, I, I think it's a good solution. So it's going to improve the situation. Out there. Yeah, I mean, you still, you know, even if nothing happened, you'd still have a, bad, a driveway in a bad place. So even if it was one house, that, 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 that's it been remedied. As it exists, it's an issue. As it's proposed, it's a betterment. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Good. You know, well, and for us, you know, just the final, uh, the applicants provided a SWIP. So again, we'll, this is the final configuration of the property. We'll give the SWIP a final review based upon this configuration. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, we're pretty much uh, okay with the project. That's what I needed to hear. Okay. That's All it. right. So we move forward. Moving forward. Where are we on this? Good question. I think you did a public. PIH and a public hearing, right, Robert? We, we just did the public informational meeting. Okay. okay. All right, so we set a public hearing then. Good. Okay. Thank you for your help. So you want to do that on the 25th? You tell us. I can't do the 11th because the deadline was today. Okay. The 25th. So. The 25th. Yeah. You'll be ready? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. you taking care of that. Have a good evening. You too. You. Be well. Good night. Okay, next we got Boniello Equity Subdivision. This is discussion of subdivision. Location is uh, 201 True, 2016 Crown Pound Road. How are you? Good, good evening. Good evening. Just a few changes to the plan. Since our last meeting, we met with those neighbors who had a few concerns. So we met with the neighbors. We um, for the neighbor uh, Austin's, we uh, told them that we were going to put screen in between, on the property line between our proposed house and theirs. Um, that seems to take care of their, one of their issues. Okay. Major issue. The other one was the, on the other side. The neighbor's name is Davis. We had gone over some drainage uh, suggestions. Yeah. And. Um, First of all, our site, all the drainage is going into subsurface Coltex. Right. But they have a problem kind of beyond our our area that we're disturbing, so to speak. And um, it's been like that for 40 years that I know of, and it goes across this driveway. And we discussed some options, and we came up with a resolution to that. We're going to put the catch basin at the end of the property, bring it back uh, towards Crompound Road, Okay. And then dis discharge it into an existing swale on the side of his property. Keeps uh, basically we're capturing all the water, 100% of the water that goes onto the Davis's driveway. Yeah, that shows the uh, arborvities between the, the buildings. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to see, but there's a catch basin at the very top, right, right about there. That's it. Yep. And it, it comes back and then just discharges into that existing swale. And that hopefully that'll, not hopefully, that will alleviate his 
ongoing problem. Any issues, Dan? No, sir. Yeah. Appreciate you talking to everybody. Yeah, it's much easier that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are I think next you can set up the, the hearing. Okay. The next one. Okay. Same day? Mm -hmm. Okay. 25th. That'd be fine. Very good. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for the help. Thank you. Public hearing here. Public hearing. Okay. That looks like it. No. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, just to you. All right, next on the agenda is the Shrovok International School. Why do I say it's good to be back here when oh, I get treated yeah. like this? <laughs> I miss you too. You were Joe Rena in your last. So. Good to see you all. David Steinmetz from the law firm of Zarin and Steinmetz here tonight on behalf of Shrovok International School. I'm joined by Brian Koffler from Shrub Oak International School and How are you? Jerry Schwabe. I'm going to be very brief and let Jerry do a quick presentation. You'll recall when we were back here last year on this matter, we were modifying our phasing. Uh, we were addressing the sequence that different improvements uh, would be performed. Uh, Jerry's going to walk through a few of the changes that have been made. Um, there have been discussions also with the building department. You all may recall that the building inspector and the planning department had both raised with us concerns about parking, uh, which we think we have um, addressed and come up with a good way to unfold <coughs> the parking on site. The most important message for the board, the school is doing well. Um, it is absorbing students um, more or less the way uh, Brian and his father Michael had told the town it would in a nice steady clip. Um, we're really happy that, uh, that the school is now getting to a point where uh, we can begin to look at the future phases and, and the continued expansion um, of the success of the program. So Good with news. that, Jerry? Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, Jerry Schwabe with uh, D DTS, keep saying Divney Tongue Schwabe, but DTS Provident as we merged with, the, with another firm. So um, We've done a lot of work, and, and the school has been doing great, as David mentioned. So the population is growing. Um, the plan is still, the program's the same. It's still 300 uh, students <coughs> programmed for the property. Uh, things change, and, th and as they grow, obviously, parking could, could develop a little bit higher rate of, of per student as, as needed, or it may be less in the future. We don't know, but right now we're trying to carry what we think it's going to be. Uh, so the changes that we had in the master plan, and so this is the uh, uh, aerial image that we had, I think last time as well, showed the building. Now this is predates the school being there, right? But not much has changed other than what you see there. There's been improvements to the front <coughs> of the building with the portico share. There's been a, the driveway, uh, uh, courtyard entryway that's been upgraded a little bit more with more landscaping. And substantial internal improvements. And internally, which is probably the most of what's been done so far is in getting a, a, a different use building to be a school, right? So everything had to be changed inside. Uh, and, and some things had not been maintained for a long time, things you don't see, like the fire line that goes around the building. They had to repair that and make sure that was working properly. Uh, electrical upgrade from Con Ed all the way down from the street all the way to the site underground was replaced. Communication systems. Um, you recall in phase one we had uh, a fence around the property that was installed. Um, the parking lot, as you know, we've been back and forth trying to get the right number and, and, and making that work. And that's kind of what we're here tonight is to make sure whatever we go forward with uh, is going to work. And we don't want to build 300 something parking spaces or 400 parking spaces up front and have it sit there, which doesn't make any sense and it's obviously a big cost as well. So we're trying to build this in a, in a way we can phase it. So we've done phase one. Uh, all the work is done. I think some of the lighting is being tweaked as we speak, but uh, when we've been here last year to modify phase one, whatever that was, in terms of a reduced scope so they could close out that project. So now we're into phase two, uh, which, in, which basically increases some of the parking. But in, from an overall master plan point of view, the things that we've changed was relocated parking areas. I don't know if you recall, uh, those those side curved roads on the right-hand side 
uh, the service roads, we had parking shown there day one. And that's, that's now being relocated to the side and to the back. Um, we've eliminated the equestrian barn. I'm gonna to switch to a different, pro, uh, different sheet here. So we've color coded this, and I think you've got this in your packet mm -hmm. as well. It kind of shows you where we're, how we're phasing the project. So the first phase, uh, the second phase is the beige areas, which show uh, the additional parking on the side of the building. You'll see the service roads, as I mentioned, don't have any parking there now. Uh, to clean up some of the geometry, or allowing the cars when they enter the campus, without going through the Porto Cachere area, area, we're gonna have another um, road coming out here in this location. So that brings everyone out from the main entrance drive right to the parking lot without going through the front visitor center, the drop off thing where the kids are and so forth. And then adding more parking, uh, which is needed on the right hand side of the, par uh, of the building. Um, stormwater basins are gonna be planted and also adding a small um, animal barn uh, building uh, located, I don't know if you can see that here. right here in this location. Um, and that's really it for phase two. And then fa obviously there's things in the building that is always ongoing, right, as you know. Um, and then phase three includes the, uh, which, color? which is the green color, uh, which is on the right-hand side, more parking. That's assuming we get to that level. We have uh, paddocks in the south lawn area, which will be part of the programs they have with the animals. Uh, using that for, uh, for you know, treatment with, with, with the students. On the left-hand side of the building, right below that left-hand wing there is the natatorium, which is a pool, be a two, le uh, two uh, uh, pool building, um, and it'll be attached into the, uh, into the building itself, so you access it through the building, not from the outside. Now, obviously, deliveries and things are on that back side, which makes sense as the loading area and the back of house stuff that's gonna be there. And then over to the bottom there, the other green area you'll see is a, a, a parking lot, which, which was uh, discussed with the uh, parks uh, department uh, uh, for the Granite Knolls Park to share a gravel lot that they would use only when needed, it wouldn't be all the time. Matter of fact, you know, in off days, if, if the school had use for a program there with the kids, they would be able to use it as well. But the idea is to be mostly for parks and overflow from the park area. To do that, we have to build a small driveway extension. I think we looked at this out in the field uh, <coughs> last, I think it was the last year we were out there. Yeah, so a while ago. Yeah, if we go straight through where the driveway, where the parking lot is now that they've built, it's too steep. So we wanna go to the left where it kind of goes uphill and then comes in level and it line up with that, the first bay of that parking lot. So that kind of makes sense. And that would be in the third uh, third phase. Then the, uh, the blue area represents the fourth phase, uh, which includes the bulk of the remaining parking. Now I have to admit that that's down the road a little bit. So if we say there's another 80 cars, <coughs> they may only need 50 or 30 and they're not gonna build it all out. What we're trying to do is show you the construction phasing of the project, but not necessarily each little piece that may come out through it. And they'll work with the building department to do that. So we've designed the grading and everything for this whole plan, and that was submitted in a package to you, and hopefully we can get through the, the details of that as we go forward. It's sort of like land bank parking that we're unfolding yeah. in a phased fashion. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you can see from the beige and the green, we're trying to keep the parking close to the building. That was a concern that we had heard from some of the town officials about making sure we had parking proximate to the building, so people were not walking too far. As part of that, uh, we're including this driveway or roadway that comes from here, this side of the east side of the building, wraps around to the west side, and that's the fire access road. That would be 26 feet wide, uh, apparatus access road. And then there's an existing driveway that goes north and south here. Um, that would be widened uh, to 20 feet to provide full emergency access as needed, and that would wrap around to the south side and then connect into that driveway that we mentioned about connecting into the park area. So it'll be a full circulation both ways. So the 
the parks folks said that we'd be able to come through their site for emergency access as well as going north if there was an issue on their site uh, during access, emergency access issues. Uh, there is a gate there. There's a gate on the south end. I don't know if you remember that when we down walked down it right about here. Uh, and my understanding is that that is now motorized as well as additional security cameras on the campus and so forth. So things are building up. The programs are getting stronger and, you know, the need for more uh, eyes on the campus, yep. so to speak, you know, is, is, is important. Um, and then the other thing that we had changed from way back on the master plan, we originally had a driveway that came out. Um, there was a location here about that had a secondary access driveway to the parking lot up, up to the north this way. And then there was also uh, a, an option to come down through this way down to the parks area, sort of being a split road. When we did uh, initially look at that in more detail, uh, the cut and fill was tremendous. We were looking at about 40,000 yards of cut to do that roadway. Um, the school does not need it. Uh, they want to have everything come out to the front where it's controlled. One of the reasons why we have that beige area in phase one, that, that access road going out to the main driveway, so that the employees and the, and the workers come in through that side. Public side goes to the front where the visitor parking is, and then you know, in the future we have that emergency access down to the south. Uh, we want everybody to take a look at it, make sure that everyone's comfortable with it. You know, I, I think uh, this, at least this first or second phase, uh, we got a letter from the, uh, it was the fire department, I think? Uh, fire, um, yeah. Part, yeah, fire department that was okay with phase two. So uh, obviously when we go each phase, we want to take a closer look at everything as we from a code perspective and make sure that's all, you know, up and up. Um, real quick, just to give you a sense of the other drawings that we had, we, this shows phase one, I'm sorry, phase two uh, details. We had done stormwater testing in the last couple of weeks. Uh, unfortunately, the soils aren't, the soils are okay, but the groundwater is very high up in this area. You think on top of the ridge it'd be, you know, drier but the soils just, just hold that moisture in. So we're not gonna be able to do a lot of infiltration. We'll have to use some of the other measures that DEC allows, like uh, uh, actually what they did in the park, these wetland pockets that they did out in the park was is one option, or bioretention where it filters through this, the, the structured soil that you put in there. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at that as terms of the treatment, stormwater treatment. And we'll review that with uh, uh, Dan CRC to make sure that he's comfortable with that as well. I remember it's got to be it's a year we were out there, right? Last year, yeah, we saw that. So I remember Dan got, was there too. We got yeah. the history lesson from Dan as we walked through. <laughs> <laughs> it's an odd area with the water, though. You know, even where Con Ed, where they did the gas. Yeah. yeah. If you ever walk on that, it really is. It, yeah. It, yeah, it just holds very the water. The soils are very fine. Yeah, the whole area, though. When they did the Puerto Cachera, when they dug down the five, six feet to the, for the footings, yeah, it, water came in. Huh. Right? That's at the top of the. Yeah, it's right very, there. very interesting. It is, yeah. I mean, in the summer when you probably get down that August, it probably dries out a little bit much more. Yeah. But, but last year we had so much rain in the summer, it still retained the water. You know, one of the things because of that, um, let me just go back. Um, over here. There's uh, when they built the building, they had a uh, small drain. I think it's the footing drains that come out of the, the building. Uh, DEP was out there, and it was in August or so that we were looking at it, and it was draining. Hmm. So they called it a water course. We disagree with it, <laughs> <laughs> but we had to kind of sep separate our parking away from that about 100 feet because they don't allow impervious area within uh, 100 feet of that of that water course. Um, Maybe this year it'll dry up. I don't know, but we'll see. Very interesting. And then just real quick, this is the, um, that's the natatorium. That was the building, the, the two-pool building. And there's a nice rendering here that uh, mm -hmm. uh, nice. the architects put together. Um, and, you know, one side will be higher than the other, so there's sort of a exposed foundation wall on the low side. And then what you don't see is against the building there's a, the connection that goes through that. 
this is the uh, animal barn shed that uh, it's a prefab shed but it looks quite nice and that'll be down on the south end there that I showed you before um, cool. and then the kids can go out there and there's a little room in there they can have little programs and things in there as well it's not that big it's about 52 feet long and that's sort of the wrap up of the master plan okay What's next? Well, you get that question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to live up to my reputation as a curmudgeon and talk about the change in the access road, which I'm sure th these guys were anticipating. But um, that's a cut his mic at the <laughs> 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 you know that's that's a, a change that I think you have to pay attention to. Uh, this use, while it is still a residential use, as has been in the past as, as the uh, religious use and then subsequently as the Phoenix High School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this will have more students and more people living there than I think those did, I believe. But I think there will be far more teachers here in the, in the highest, most intense iteration of this. So that is a lot of folks on the site at one time, probably more than we have seen. And I'm not speaking from experience, but I think that is a likely into, uh, presumption that we can make. <coughs> Given the fact that you now also have a major and very wonderful park next door to it, which is connected to this and the original way into what was that area and the, what the town was using, that little parking lot with some basketball hoops and so forth was through the straight road that connects to Stony Street and goes up the hill that we all know about. Right. That connection is now, uh, connect, you know, it's connected to Granite Knolls. In terms of talking about emergency access, you guys are the ones that determine appropriate emergency access, where from, where to, how much and what color, not any other board. Um, in terms of non-emergency use, I think we have to look at and be, uh, the, the school may not need an additional entrance, and I think that is fine. But I think understanding uh, how these sites are working together, because they will, will work together, with the advent of the new parking lot, which is really for the Parks Commission, their, their request that they are working more together, that that possibility of an egress and ingress is more maybe more important than when we first looked at this and I think you need to understand how that will be used in the natural way that people choose their routes which sometimes they do very quickly when they get into a line or so on and so forth if they choose that and you do not have a safe e egress for instance you know that's that's trouble that's mm -hmm. troublesome so I think it's something that you have to take a close look at, and I think we have to look at the use of the park, the, the most intense use of the school to figure out what that need will be, and what, if any, whether or not you can lose that road, and if you can, what, to what extent you need to improve the existing roadway and its connection to Stony Street. Because certainly in its <coughs> existing iteration, it's not adequate for the way it was used prior. So I think that's an important aspect. In terms of next steps, um, I think it, I think we go start going through what is essentially an amendment. So it, it will be, you know, make referrals and so on and so forth. A word about the phasing, and you may touched on this, Jerry, and I, I apologize if you did, and I'm speaking about something that's already determined by you guys. Two ways to look at it. You can approve a phased plan without really knowing much about the subsequent phases, or you can do a say you know 90 percent level plan with phases so that each sub subsequent phase can come back and have it be a little bit easier for them to start that phase rather than a, a more intense look mm -hmm. each time they right. elect to pursue a phase so i just want to get that out there i think we agree with john on that yeah, i, I think on the, the 90 percent and want to do the 90 percent yeah um i, I just, just want to try to respond a little bit on the access. I, I'm not surprised. John, John knows we've been talking about this together 
five years or so, whatever it is. It's 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 a it's a number of years. Five years. I think I think Sorry. we would. I mean, it's it's important that the board knows the applicant does not believe they need that additional connection to Stony Street. They would prefer to not build the additional connection. And as Jerry points out, it's not like it comes without cost and environmental impact. It's a substantial amount of earth movement to do it. So as we said years ago, and I think we underscore now, while I totally understand that a, 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 a planner perspective might be this is a, a prudent thing, this is a good conservative thing to do, before you do it, the flip side, just like he wants you to take a good look at it, we want you to take a good look at it as well because we don't think it's necessary. We think it may be un unnecessarily impactful. And to the extent that we're going to come back for future phases and we're going to be looking at the site, maybe the appropriate thing to do is to defer any kind of final determination on that because if, if your concern, John, is vehicular movement there, our client believes the single point of ingress and egress works for staff, for visitors, and for emergency vehicles. So they, they're not looking to promote this extra curb cut, this extra way in. Um, I hope we're not getting penalized in some way by trying to be completely cooperative with the town and the park connection. Um, that, you know, I heard a comment about, you know, the possibility of some parking from the, the town park spilling over into this gravel area. The Cofflers have really done everything they can to try to cooperate with the Parks Department. I think the Parks Department completely endorses what we're doing here. Um, and the fact that we do have reciprocal emergency access, we think addresses the, the concern that would absolutely be predominant. If we, if we didn't have it, we'd be in trouble. We would not have emergency access, and I, I don't think I'd have a good response to, to what John's raising. The fact that we have the connection to the park and we can make use of it and they can make use of our site, we think obviates the need to do a 40,000 cubic yard cut. So do the operations coincide? I mean, I went up to the park in the middle of the winter and the gate's shut and you can't get in. So what, what happens uh, you know, at that point? So the, who can't get in, the park's people? The park has a gate, so that would have to be coordinated somehow. The, so the entrance to Granite Knolls Park is, may not be open the same time that your school's in operation. That's the question I'm asking. I understand. So, so is there? I don't. I don't know the the gate. Is it a crash gate? Is it something that the first responders have clickers I, and I capability? I, well, that's something for us to figure. You know, to think right. about. Because we're, we're we're completely fine if if there is that ability to open our gate and open their gate. That okay. that should happen. Right. Um, that that yeah. would not be a first for for municipal government to have part of the access. part of the genesis of the original discussion about that was not singularly related to emergency access. I get it, yep. So, I mean, it is and was an ingress and egress that's used. Um, it may be, be uh, being used less now, but I think as time goes on and these usages that are neighbors to one, each, one, one another become more intensely used, you may see that increase. So the question is, is whether or not granite knolls in this site are served properly by only the two egress and ingresses. That's the issue. When you draw okay. people over, if, if the Parks Rec Commission is anticipating that they will need additional parking, you know, I think it, need, it bears even more scrutiny at this point. So the, the fact that you're, you're adding the parking for them you know, gives me greater pause on, on that. So the question discussion. is that, that, John, that's why I said are we being penalized a little? I, I, I don't know the math, you, you may, as to which use is generating your stomach ache. Um, is it my client's use with, with shift changes and, 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 and they have an economic interest to make sure that their people get in and out safely and timely? Or are you concerned about Yorktown residents going to this recreational park and creating a high demand at that point the issue is, are you asking us to have to deal with a 40,000 cubic yard cut on our property to accommodate the town park? What I'm saying is that there's an existing roadway that those users of the park and or your site can avail themselves of, which is completely out of conformance with the code in grade, how it connects to Stony Street, its width, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> that has to, I think that has to be dealt with. Who will use it the most, if, if, if that's the question? That's kind of the question. That's kind of the question. You know, I think, I think park users will use it. I think they will use it even more now that you are accommodating, 
accommodating them with the with parking, the parking lot. lot. Yeah. So oh, what, that, hence, the, don't penalize us for the parking well, lot. Well, it's not a penalization. It's really making sure that the, that the users of both sites can get in and out of the facilities safely. Has and, Parks uh, said to you, Brian, that they believe they're going to have difficulty? I mean, you've had conversations with them far more than we have. They have. Busy. And also mm -hmm. that back room is walking. Brian. Oh, sorry. How are you? Good, how are you? Uh, the back road that we're talking about on the, the south end of the property, it is chained on the bottom. No one comes in or out of there unless they ask us. And we, so we, when the park needs it, we open it up for any other equipment that has to come up. But we have no intention of currently opening that back road to our staff or to anybody. You're unless about unless steep they ask us. If we request it, then we open it. Uh, right, but so it is a too steep of a road. There's no question. It's a very steep driveway. Uh, we have a fence on the top uh, so the west end of the property, that's our electric fence that we have. It's really just there for our people to access the park. That, that's it. Really, cars don't go in and out of there, except for, for plowing snow out of the driveway. Um, but the, yeah, the parking lot itself, ideally the goal is going, we'd be moving that chain up to go right next to where the parking lot is so no one's going down the driveway. That would be our ideal scenario for... Yeah we'd like it to be yeah and, and i understand that and appreciate it um when legacy field was constructed you know they had problems with what they thought they needed so there was problems getting in problems getting out um i'm not certain that uh this amendment removes a potential access for both sites and i think it needs to be looked at closely okay okay so who's looking at it are we looking at it are you having a, your town uh traffic consultants look at you looking well, at you, it you're amending you're amending your site plan so i think you're looking at it okay um okay it, any, anybody have any thoughts and concern you know to the extent that the applicant it feels like they are being asked to deal with something that i i, I have a thought i mean just i may be ignorant of fact but when the, the uh, sports uh, complex was approved. Didn't they satisfy the egress and uh, coming and going? Why should it be a concern now? I, I it was no, it was a concern then as well. But like I said, but still, at that point when they approved that project, that egress and that coming and going was approved. So why should it be a problem now? Why should it coming up as a problem? It, it was connected to this roadway. It, it, there was always a connection to this roadway so that we're speaking about. What's the change now? They're, they're taking, they're, it, they're away. taking it away. So, they're, so they're, here, they're, here, when the granite knolls was approved, I think I know your question. When the granite knolls was approved, it was approved with a parking lot near this roadway that's on their site, and it was connected to that roadway. The way into that park, in the originally, was through this roadway that we're speaking of. So that connection was always there. So the approval had that connection okay. already. So what we were doing back then was not only looking at the, what this site was doing, but also thinking about its neighbor yeah. in the same way we think about parking lots connecting so that everything's safe and things move better. It was multi-issued uh, uh, consideration. It wasn't just emergency access. Yeah. It wasn't just Granite Knolls getting in and out. It was those folks, their emergency, Granite Knolls, et cetera, et cetera. Can I respond to Mr. Lascal's comment? <clears throat> because I don't know exactly what the town had in mind and what it did at the time it was approving the park. We were all excited about the park for sure. That roadway is there. That driveway is there, the steep driveway. If the town approved Legacy Park, knowing that that was there and thinking, well, maybe we'll make use of that if need be, my client has no objection to trying to figure out how the town could keep doing that. We don't, we don't have to eliminate it. We would presumably have to fence on the north side of it to prevent anybody. Sorry, fence. <clears throat> Sorry, fence on, on the north side. Okay. So I guess what I'm, well, if, if, if Shrub Oak International School is, does not have to be asked to improve that area for the benefit of the park, if the town decides that it wants to improve that area, we could certainly talk about an access and a construction easement if that's what the town is, is trying to accomplish. Which, which area? 
your right. response your response i think to me was your response to mr Lascala was well at the time they approved legacy park there was this connection that they want to close off oh, right now is that not what i just that they want to close off who wants to close it i don't is it closed it's not closed there's yeah. a gate there or there's a there's a gate there's a gate that's all it says okay. and you could open the chain a gate yeah. where the old access road but the, the it's gated at what point down at the bottom down at the bottom okay Look, let's take a look at it. We, yeah, we don't I, want to. We don't want to be difficult the very for the least, town board yeah, by any at, means. At the very least, Dave, you know that they have to go through, and make a reasoned elaboration as to the removal of that in in the light of public safety. I Got mean, it. they have to do that. Okay. So I, I mean, I think if that's the starting point, fine. Also, I think what their charge is is also to make these sites work so everybody is safe. And one, and we're not planning every single time a collection of sites that work only unto themselves. I mean, that's I agree essentially with that. it. I, I hope that that's the case. Right. Okay. So, you know, I understand the cost and the and the amount of uh, cut and fill that you have identified. That doesn't mean that killing this beast that we're talking about has to be done in the exact same way either. So there may be something there in between that makes all of this work very well. It's not going to hurt anybody's pocketbook and safer for everybody. Good, all right. Well, if but, um, you've got some suggestions, I, I hope you'll confer with Jerry and, and our traffic people. John, uh, quick question. Are looking at this too, or, or not? Parks. Or park, park and Rec, have they been looking at it? I think Park and Rec has looked at this more than this board as <laughs> so far. So, you know, a footnote here is that the approval of Granite Knolls did not come to this board other than yeah. a couple of nights in a referral. Right. So, as did Legacy Field. So if you, if you understand the history that I'm alluding to here, that I think this board typically does a very good job and wants to do a very good job in terms of making things work properly. And other folks have different, just different paths that they are on. I'm not, it's not a criti criticism. It's just that they have different considerations. John, a quick question. So that road down at the bottom right that we're talking about in that picture, mm -hmm. that goes into the parking lot. Is that a town road or is that a private driveway? It's a private driveway that in some manner was used by the public to get up to the little park right. that is now where the yeah. pavilion is. Yeah. It's on our, I believe it's, 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 it's on his property. Yeah, I think yeah. So, so on, how does yeah. the town have that. any say over what gets done with that driveway? If they want to close the, drive, the, the driveway. You have the say over what happens to this site in order for it to be used by the 500 students and, and or the 300 yeah. students yeah. and the 500 teachers. None of whom drive. You okay. have that say. <clears throat> right. End of story. The 300 students, again, just so that, the, wow, that sounds scary. None of whom <laughs> drive. <laughs> None of whom <laughs> drive. No, but the 500 teachers do. All right. All right. But, but just, just so okay, we're clear. It's so a side plan. Right. Yeah. That's it. This is an interesting back and forth. Oh, it's always, look, John's right. We showed a connection. We're not going to, he knows that we realized that we showed a connection to Stony Street originally. And now it's being. I, I remember, know. and I, I remember there was a sewer issue. I, I, I'm trying to piece together the history there. Well, the parks wanted to connect the sewers to this yeah. site. It's no, been it's a long time. But eventually, I think they went down. Yeah, down. Yeah, they went down. Joe Rena did the, the park, right? Correct. Yep. And, and, of course, I've always been a, an advocate for connections, not just here, mm -hmm. but everywhere. And I happen to think, I, for instance, Legacy, Legacy Field doesn't work as well as it should because it's one way in and one way out. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a problem. In the beginning of the use of that site, there was uh, people parked all along the road. It was a safety issue. Well, I think even in the shopping centers, right, along Route 6, I think you've been consistent. Yeah. You talked about the Yorktown uh, proper, the interconnections, so that everything sure. flows when it's necessary. Right. So it's something we're going to have to look at. We're going to look at. Uh, glad you're doing very well. That's exciting news. Um, and we'll have to dig into the weeds on this. All right. We'll, we'll take it up with, our, with, with the uh, DTS Provident traffic people. We'll submit some information to try to explain whether we think there is a legitimate justification to close the connection to Stony, and how the sites would function. We'll look at that. We'll look at the gate issues that we talked about, yeah. um, and 
we'll submit something and try to get back on a future agenda. The only thing I would, especially with the use of the school, make sure tomorrow is that the emergency responders have access to that. Yeah, yeah. You know. the, the, it's, uh, we're manned 24-7. There's always someone at the gate all the time. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, you know, obviously that's the biggest thing. No question about down. that. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. It was good seeing you. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Glad all's well. Take care. All right. Do I motion to close the hearing or the uh, the meeting? Motion. Motion. All in favor? Don't you remember right. the two kids that, that meeting. tired? Meeting. meeting. It's been a long day.